The Thought League, a new show which focuses not just on generating ideas from the best thinking minds, but also goes a step closer into the execution bit, whether or not these ideas are actionable for unparalleled outcomes. Today we have with us on the show from the think tank, Cyril Shroff, as well as Uday Kota. Gentlemen, so good to have you on CNBC TV 18. Uday Kota, starting with you, one of your tweets which mentioned that India should be the world's office really generated a lot of interest. What exactly do you mean by that statement? And how does it tie in with the government's push towards an Atmanirbhar Bharat? Nisha, thank you very much. Uh, I first of all relate with the government's uh, focus on getting manufacturing in India as China, which is the factory of the world, will come under pressure on grounds of concentration and geopolitics. Therefore, while India must certainly focus on getting manufacturing, I think a huge opportunity is India becoming the office of the world, both the front office and the back office. And in many ways, they say a crisis creates an opportunity. I think uh, COVID is one of those events which is creating a huge opportunity where it is possible for a person sitting anywhere to provide a service or a delivery in any other part of the world. Therefore, if Google can hire people from small town America and have them work from home, I don't see any reason why the Googles, the Amazons, the Geos of the world can hire people from the smallest town or village in India, well connected, to provide services in the area of engineering, other skills across the digital and virtual platforms which is why I believe this is a game-changing opportunity for India to be both the front office and the back office for the entire world. Uday Kota, while we have been using internet for such a long time, but the very thought of work from home or having a laptop and a good Wi-Fi and work from anywhere across the world has really dawned upon us only in these times. Um, Cyril Shroff, what do you think about the scope of this idea that has been uh, generated by Uday Kota. Thank you, Nisha, and uh, I welcome everyone to the show as well. So the idea about India becoming the both the front and the back office of the world is a very big idea with huge potential. It is only our battle to lose if we do not embrace it with boldness and with imagination. And I think the time is right. So firstly, what is the size of the prize? It's huge. I think it goes into billions of dollars. Uh, we are also at a very good launch point because the Indian professionals already have a great reputation in the world. External factors are working in providing good tailwinds. For example, the entire H-1B visa problem. Uh, secondly, the fall of Hong Kong uh, and the China backlash. And generally, the hardening of immigration regimes uh, all over the world coupled with the fact that technology is almost like a rocket fuel to this idea. Let's look at this range of possibilities in financial services, uh, education technology, medical, uh, med tech or med, uh, uh, medical technology, surgery with the internet of things. You can have a surgeon sitting in one corner of the world and doing an operation through the internet on the other end of the world. I mean, all of this is now possible. So the technology has kind of made a lot of provision of services uh, location agnostic. And uh, in each of these uh, subjects, there could be a number of uh, permutations that are possible, say in financial services. You know, I think that with the fall of, uh, fall of Hong Kong, we, could be think, we can think of ourselves as a global financial uh, center as well. And there is a hybrid that we can create somewhere between, say, you know, London, Dublin and Singapore. Why can't we be any of those? And because technology, I think, is providing the means to do that. Our IT services, which is the backbone of the so-called back office, already has a fantastic reputation. And I think we need to build a framework for the front office, which is, which is a very different ballgame. Uday Kota, while we are talking about taking advantage of uh, the digital revolution in the world and also finding opportunities in the face of adversity, how do you see this manifesting and how will it get executed? I think, Nisha, first of all, uh, at a time when we are seeing 
a very significant need for a rural urban rebalance and when on a separate note there is massive migration out of urban into rural we can actually grasp this opportunity work on education and skilling of people especially in smaller towns and villages to really reignite and reimagine india i see two major opportunities as india moves from physical to digital first uh, the nature of jobs and the future of jobs is changing and reskilling will be absolutely essential second we need to dramatically increase connectivity in rural india and i am actually very enthused where i believe the quality of life in small town india will actually be superior than many parts of metro and urban india and if we can rekindle this as a dream for a more appropriate and a balanced india we could see balanced regional growth across the country and combine this with areas of telemedicine uh providing uh, significant opportunities in uh agriculture and whole host of things and rural india could be the engine for india's future growth and our traditional view that migration is rural to urban can be turned around on its head and we can actually have the making of a new india right and uh, how much time are you really giving for this to happen because uh, you know the employability and the talent uh, retention ability of india has not been ranked at the best level so far and for this to happen for work from for home to happen a lot of skilled labor and skilled talent is required to they i think the big advantage in asia is uh, the time is now and number 2 thanks to digital again training should be much more digital there will be elements of physical which is needed but we can dramatically increase online training and i would say that time is not on our side we should be doing it over the next 1 to 3 years at great speed to transform the whole landscape and we also got to keep in mind that we are in the middle of adversity there is a yes. significant challenge to physical jobs in physical locations therefore out of that adversity we want we got to create a necessity of reskilling online is the answer much better broadband connectivity across the country is an answer and truly if we want atmanirbhar bharat it will have to be a balanced india between metro and rural india all right so sirin straw for this a big idea going here but as far as the execution from the other aspects is concerned from the policy framework we need to leap from into manifesting this digital revolution to our benefit right now what are the things required for this entire framework to work out for it to make it conducive for us to realize this particular transition thanks nisha i think the first thing that is required is that we need to reimagine the talent model so that that will then be the basis of starting the reverse brain drain both from outside into india as well as uh, as uday just mentioned that you can have your talent working from anywhere uh, including from from rural india so this requires a, a reimagination of various uh, what i call fossilized legal regulatory and tax concepts uh, because those are some of the biggest hurdles in enabling this to happen especially where we are talking of the front office it's a little easier for the back office but when you talk of the front office Uh, then this is slightly different ball game and some of our major institutions will need to be strengthened or even rebuilt what are the three things that uh, are major requirement when you think of an idea as big as this first i think is talent we have to become a talent magnet from the best talent anywhere in the world uh, why should why should there be a brain drain of our best mind going outside a lot of minds from outside not only returning indians but some of the best minds in the world can come and work here the second i think is building of institutions including our justice and dispute resolution system i think a lot of things come crashing to the ground when we land up uh, in our legal system and the third is a broader regulation and governance system i think both public and private governance will have to change dramatically in order for something like this to happen employment contracts consumer protection because if you think of the possibility of you know somebody sitting in india 
and servicing a consumer uh, in the US or vice versa, how do you protect that consumer? We'll need to reimagine professional ethics and governance in a global scene. Tax is a very big issue, uh, especially because the whole the, the tax structure is largely based on the idea of physical presence. Now, there are some initial uh, moves on the whole idea of digital tax and equalization levy and all of that. But the, the bias, the underlying bias and undercurrent of tax is still very much linked to physical presence. So we will need to make sure that we don't inadvertently stumble into a framework which makes it very expensive from a tax point of view. So that will require boldness. We'll need to think of market access and uh, also national treatment. Probably GATS, uh, there will be parts of GATS which may have to be renegotiated. Uh, so the, the, when you move away from uh, centuries of uh, thinking which is design, devised around physical presence and now make that location agnostic uh, and provide, uh, you try to then regulate not the service provider but the nature of the service itself, it's a completely different ball game. We need a framework where we can trust and honor risk takers because this is going to require a lot of entrepreneurship, it's going to involve a lot of taking of risks and we need to give them that kind of enabling framework and encouragement to do this. All right, so that's a very, very valid point. In fact, we'll pick on that in the next segment. We'll slip into a very short break on the Thought Leak. Welcome back. You're watching the Thought League with Uday Kotak and Cyril Shroff. Now, before we headed into a break, um, Cyril Shroff made an important point on bridging the trust deficit between the government as well as the entrepreneur class. You have been dealing, Uday Kotak, with many business houses. You have been dispersing loans to them over many years. What is the kind of sentiment that you see right now? And how can that sentiment be lifted at a time when most companies are trying to really deal with the survival aspects? First, from a policy point of view, I think India must honor risk takers. There is a general view that risk takers in general have done not always the right things. I think we need to divide the risk takers into two categories. People who have taken the risks, followed a path of compliance and proper governance and they should be truly respected and honored because they are the ones who are creating value for the country. And I am not saying that there are people, if anybody has done something which is incorrect, that's a separate category. So, and we should not in any way hide them under the grounds of risk taking. But those who have played with a straight bat and have taken risk, the policy makers need to reach out and encourage them to continue down the path of risk rather than them saying, oh, it's getting to be much more unpredictable in the future. And I would strongly encourage all risk takers, do not look at the rear view mirror while driving the car. Look at the windshield in front of you. But Uday Kotak, financial services system in any country is the backbone for any business to survive. And presently, looking at the overall condition, the burden of moratorium, IBC being stalled, few buyers for any uh, distressed assets right now. How do you think the NBFC as well as the banking space tackle the situation and will they have bandwidth to further any animal spirits which comes from the entrepreneurs? Okay, Nisha, first the good news. Uh, between oh, the last few months, we are seeing a very significant push by many players in the financial sector to go out and raise equity capital, which is risk capital. Therefore, the bedrock of the financial sector is a stronger risk capital base. And I think the financial sector is going all out to beef up its reserves to be able to absorb the shocks coming out of the crisis. Let's be proper in the use of our capital. Let's not get carried away. We need to ensure that we are getting risk-adjusted returns and not uh, taking risks without appropriate returns. That is a general message to the financial sector. And on the broader financial sector relationship with the regulatory framework, I think there has been a lot of challenges in the past, and it's important that the financial sector steps up and gets it right. As a general philosophy, and this is across all of India, not just the financial sector, but this includes both corporate India and other segments of Indian business. 
vis-a-vis -vis the government i have just one statement to the government please trust enterprise and message to enterprise let us be trustworthy cyril shroff we have seen several financial services institutions in the past going through very difficult times and unfortunately each of the resolutions have been very piecemeal and different in their approach is there a requirement for a framework of sorts for these resolutions as many more distresses may come out in the market in coming times and on the other hand do we have any lessons or a template from any of the countries where it has worked well absolutely and i think your question in a way answers itself uh, just to build on what uday said that the financial sector is getting better as it is recapitalizing but i think there is a, a, a significant need for faster resolution of uh, entities stressed entities in the financial sector if you look at some of the recent examples of a leading nbfc a bank and others uh, we've seen different tools being used i think it is time now to just uh, relook at and have a uh, have a more comprehensive tool that can be used for uh, for this uh, in, in the form of a, a financial sector kind of resolution system very much like some of the parts of the dot frank uh, regime that uh, was created in the us where you can even have what's called the living will of a corporate entity where you have an advanced kind of resolution plan that is baked in right in the beginning so it's time to reimagine that we've we've struggled through many uh, sort of options that have been used in the past sort of 24 months but that can't be the future there is a lot of financial stress uh, still in the system and we need to create a kind of a more universal and a more pragmatic framework that can move quickly it should also move away from courts and it should move into a, a speedy regulator driven uh, flexible regime that can quickly find uh, quick, quickly find a solution so long as they kind of act fairly and in the interests of all the stakeholders this is the need of the hour if we need to fix our financial system uday kotak help us understand uh, what are the few ideas on top of your mind you have been yourself involved in the resolutions of some of these companies like ilnfs as well as yes bank is there a one define solution that the regulators as well as the banking sector can come up with a bank is an exception and i completely agree with the regulator that the protection of a bank and depositors trust in uncollateralized deposits is the heart of the banking system and therefore i would be uh, i would actually wonder whether it is possible with so many different animals in the financial sector to really come to a one size fits all solution several trends emerging when we talk about the corporate finance as well as the evidy street but cyril shroff help us also uh, understand what could be the vision that india should be working with for the year 2025 so i think the first thing is that we need to look at this from a telescope and not a microscope the moment you get into a microscope mentality you tend to get dragged into the immediate problems i think this is really about imagining india 2025 and beyond uh, there is a world of opportunity and i think as uh, uday said you only know about it once it has passed by i think we're trying to wake up uh, people to make that the opportunity is right now this uh, opportunity of services from india uh, is the opportunity staring us in our face because we have the pop the demographic uh, framework we have an english speaking population we have stem skills uh we have a, a, a kind of a liberal mindset uh, as a country this is only our battle to lose and i think a lot of uh, corporate india gets this uh the moment they change their lens and uh, sort of they, they 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 start using their bifocals and also looking at the long term i think they will see this uh, uh, opportunity as well and I, there is enough evidence of that happening as well from a policy makers point of view i think they need to work with Uh, in collaboration with uh, industry and create the framework for uh, create a framework for making this vision possible there are just there is too much regulatory cholesterol in terms of the number of uh, approvals and compliance so there is there is a theme already of ease of doing business in india i think that theme now needs to be merged with this idea of a reimagined india for the reason, for the topic that we discussed today a lot has to change
and a lot has to be imagined uh, uh, as well. So we should, uh, without any sort of further ado, I think the policy makers and business should roll up their sleeves, identify what is required and get it done fast because speed is also equally important uh, in, this, uh, in this reality. So finally, Uday Kotaka, you know, in this new world order, we have come up with new nomenclatures for BC uh, and DC as well as uh, AC, it seems, before coronavirus, we are during coronavirus. After coronavirus, how are we shaping up the world and what has been your vision? If you think about the BC world, which is before corona, the ratio of physical to digital in our lives was 80-20. 80% of our lives was physical interaction, office, meeting people, conducting meetings, and 20% was digital. In the DC world, which is during corona, it is 90-10 in favor of digital. So 90% digital and 10% physical. In the after corona world, I would like to believe that it will be more 50-50 between the physical and the digital world. And that's how I see it. 80-20 physical to 10-90 physical to 50-50 physical digital divide, as I look at it. But the in the after corona world, the world divide will go away and it will be seamless physical digital 50-50. All right, gentlemen, Uday Kotak as well as Sivan Shaw for sharing your insights. Uh, thanks to that and the three important takeaways coming out of this discussion is that India should leapfrog itself into becoming the world's office backend as well as front end. On the other hand, digital revolution is something we can really capitalize on and the trust deficit between the government as well as the entrepreneurs needs to be bridged very fast. With that, it's the end of the Thought League. Thanks so much for tuning in.